Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. It's long been an adage that what we eat reflects who we are. If this is true of individuals, it's not hard to extrapolate that it's also true for the entire country. And for the United States, beef and its mass production has long been at the center of that definition. From the mid-19th century, the history of beef parallels and often reflects social, cultural, and economic changes that were taking place. From the Great Plains in the 1850s to the slaughterhouses of the Midwest to the first McDonald's in San Bernardino in 1940, Where's the Beef often tells the story of where we are. And as we examine it today, might it tell us more about where we're going? We're going to talk about this with my guest, Joshua Specht. Joshua teaches American history at Monash University in Australia, and he's the author of the new book, Garnering Lots of Attention, entitled Red Meat Republic, a hoof-to-table history of how beef changed America. Joshua, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to have you here. Talk a little bit about where you start this story, really the, this mid-19th century point when the idea of beef for everyone really became a little more central. Yeah, so I start I, well, I start kind of in, in the mid-19th century through the aftermath of the American Civil War, a time when American power is starting to be expanded westward across the plains, and a time in which the United States is sort of starting to emerge as a big, powerful industrial economy. Um, and that's a world in which changing how we eat and kind of getting access to foods that might have been occasional foods, but making them all the time foods becomes increasingly important. And beef is kind of the best example of that. The openness of the Great Plains was was a contributing factor. Oh, for sure. I mean, in a sense, right, we have these these stories that this is just a land waiting for, you know, American industry and enterprise. But in reality, there were a lot of people living there. Um, you have the, the well-known story of the bison, which are nearly driven to extinction. And you have the various American Indian peoples who basically hunt the bison and survive off that trade associated with its hunt. And so what I trace at the beginning of the book is this process of land expropriation, seizing American Indian land, and that becomes so key to the spread of ranching. So as where you might start a traditional story about food with just the production or the farming side, I want to say, actually, we have to think about how we got all this land through a violent process. And talk a little bit about how fast, I mean, it's quite remarkable how fast this ranching, ranching industry grew at that point. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think in the early 19th century, it, there was kind of this small-scale ranching that was spreading across parts of the West. But really in the aftermath of the American Civil War, people start to realize that ranches are a good investment. And in the 1870s into the 1880s, people from the northeast of the U.S. and as far away as Scotland start pouring investment capital into places like Texas, into places like Colorado, Wyoming. And all of a sudden, all these tiny herds of cattle get aggregated into these massive operations that might have 100,000 animals. And this all is a boom that takes place over really just over 10 years. And talk a little bit about how that became industrialized, the move between those huge ranches and those huge herds that you're talking about, and essentially the industrialization of, of beef and agriculture. Yeah. So Basically, what happens is, you know, we've got these set of stories about, you know, the cowboys and, and kind of people on their own settling these things. But really, these are big businesses. Um, and the investors start to realize, you know, if you run these cattle operations like a big business, you can really see high profits. So they start to systematize everything. They start to track things. And they also start taking their herds to market in great numbers. And what that means is you start to get the nationalizing of a cattle market. And once you have cattle accumulating in places like Chicago, that gives an opening for some of these smaller, what had once been regional meat packers, to really start realizing their benefits of the economies of scale. And so once they can think about selling tens of thousands or 100,000 animals in a year, they can start to change their business in fundamental ways, invest in research and in new modes of production, having larger and larger facilities. And so the centralization of markets becomes key to this industrializing process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that also happens are, are these slaughterhouses that start to evolve. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so basically they, they start to realize the, this story. So I talk about how ranching is this big business, but really the center of the story in terms of business are these Chicago meatpacking firms. And what these firms realize is they don't want to deal with taking care of an animal from when it's born and all the risk that might entail. They want to deal with an animal as quickly as possible, take a living animal, 
and turn it into a bunch of commodities they can sell. And so they start to work to be as fast as possible along what then was called the disassembly line. Um, and so right there, it's not an assembly line that's putting something together for many parts. It's taking one thing and turning it into lots. And they start to have things like continuous motion of keeping an animal carcass moving throughout a kind of factory as they take it apart. And actually, Henry Ford, in his biography, said he got the idea for his assembly lines from watching sides of beef in these Chicago houses. And so once they can move these animals quickly, they can start to sell them more and more cheaply around the U.S., and they go from, from kind of city to city and town to town, basically bankrupting their local competition and forcing them to buy from these Chicago houses. And one of the impacts that this industrialization had is really massively bringing down the price of meat, the price of beef, and making it accessible across the country. For sure. So, you know, if you imagine you have the way you've kind of always gotten meat, um, and all of a sudden, there's this new product, right? You're used to kind of getting things that are local. You have something of a connection to the people you're buying it from. They have a connection to the people who are supplying them. All of a sudden, you're getting, you're in New York or Boston or California, and you're getting this weird meat that was maybe from an animal born in Texas and slaughtered in Chicago. Well, you know, you're going to have your doubts. But the meat packers had a weapon. They had prices. And so if their meat was 20 or 30% lower, or in some cases when they're really trying to compete, they might be half as much. Well, eventually you're going to start to be persuaded pretty quick. And so they used a conscious business strategy of not only realizing their kind of lower costs, but also just kind of predatory pricing. And eventually they got consumers on board. And there's all sorts of stories of consumer boycotts that then get basically turned by people saying, well, you know, I want to be able to afford this high quality meat. And in fact, it resulted in riots at one point. It did. So I tell the story in the book of uh, in, in New York in 1902, essentially meat prices are, are rising. Um, and as it becomes unaffordable, people be, start trashing butcher shops. They start pouring acid on meat. They start breaking windows. And one of the funniest things about that story is you get anecdotes from, you know, the, lo the, the local fishmonger or the local kind of vegetable seller saying, well, you know, you could have a potato or we can tell you how to cook fish. And basically, the consumers say, no, what we want is beef. And, they, and they, they'll actually riot rather than settle for something that isn't meat. And in part, that's because for a lot of these recent immigrants, consuming beef becomes a metric of their kind of success in America. Talk a little about how that happened, because it was as much a marketing story as it is an industrial story. Yeah, I think, I think the kind of way that happened is, first of all, there was a pretty big demand for beef from consumers. And that's because a lot of the places that people in the 19th century were immigrating from, particularly Europe, meat was kind of a special occasion food. And so they had this desire. And so once there was the opportunity to transfer it into an all the time kind of food, they would want it in, in, in more and more quantities. And you get some anxiety from kind of elites about how poorer people are spending too much money on their beef. And so when the meatpackers see this demand, well, they realize what they need to do is bankrupt their local competition and take over. And so, again, they use this, this price thing, and all of a sudden it becomes a political cause being able to afford enough beef. So the meatpackers say, hey, butchers going out of business might complain about our tactics, but look at how happy, the, you know, as they said, common laborer is because they want their beef and we can provide it. One of the fascinating things about it is how it foreshadows so much of so many other industries that came along and, and acted precisely the same way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, first, as I mentioned, Henry Ford gets his right. idea for the disassembly line. Um, but also the meat packers get invested quickly in refrigerated rail cars to keep their meat fresh. Well, those same refrigerated rail cars, which the meat packers own and control, get used for the distribution of fresh fruits and vegetables, especially ones that need to be refrigerated. Similarly, their kind of model where they deal with the living animal as, for as little time as possible and kind of displace the risk of animal raising onto these ranchers, that's a model you see replicated across agribusiness today, where a lot of the pressure and risk of kind of in the environment is put onto to relatively small farmers and ranchers, while the kind of big capitalized companies are meat processors or companies that control agricultural inputs. When there was pressure against the big slaughterhouses, against the big meat packers, because of the working conditions there, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the impact that that had on the broader beef industry. Yeah, so there was certainly a big part of, you know, in the book I talk about, I talk about this disassembly line, 
And what I say is it's not that it's kind of magically more efficient. It's actually that it allows an incredible exploitation of the people who work on it. So you can put more and more pressure on the people working. And so there were big conflicts over the nature of slaughterhouse labor. Wages were going down. It was dangerous. Um, and so there were, there were strikes and there was violence. Now, the meatpackers had a very clever defense, and, and people have written about this more broadly. What they did is um, – people have written about this in other industries. What they did is they said, look – we're helping everyone in America because we're, we're driving down prices for consumers. They didn't quite use the word consumer, but they said the public. They also tried to say this is the way kind of new industry works today. So, so Philip Armour, head of one of the biggest meatpacking firms, refers to his industry having, quote, different rules. And so they say, look, we're going to have to tolerate some of this unrest if we want to help everyone have all the meat they want. And so what they do is they make the workers seem like they're just one interest, whereas the meatpackers position themselves as the common good. The public becomes afraid of workers. Many of the workers are recent immigrants. They're kind of suspicious of these immigrants, and perhaps they get a whiff of socialism. And so they ultimately side with management and the meatpacking companies. And what impact did that have, if any, on how consumers, on how the public perceived the meat industry and the product they were buying? Well, one thing I try to think about the book is in, in the time period I write about, I see a public largely indifferent to that mm -hmm. story I just told you of worker exploitation, of the struggle of local butchers. They're really worried about uh, two things. They're worried about price and they're worried about sanitation. And so what you notice is the most effective way in which the government regulates meatpacking is around issues of sanitation. In the aftermath of, of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, you get things like the Federal Meat Inspection Act. And the reason those are successful is in part because it serves industry's interest. If they can convince people to trust the industrial food system, people aren't going to be thinking about the rest of that story. People aren't going to be thinking about labor. So the, the industry's quest is to create that kind of trust, and sanitary regulation and low prices are their vehicle for securing the public's trust. And you mentioned Armour before. Talk about some of the other big players in, in the industrialization of, of the meat industry. Sure. So, you know, we often talk about there's only meatpacking is often kind of an, an oligopoly, which means just a few companies control the whole market. So generally we talk about four or five. Um, in the time period I wrote about Armour and Company was Armour was kind of the most outspoken. So they were one of the most powerful. Uh, but you also have companies like Swift and Company, founded by a guy named Gustavus Swift, who pioneered really that refrigerated shipping. The thing that's interesting about these characters and another character who founded the company, Morrison Company, a lot of them, they're not from Chicago, but they're either immigrants or people who had grown up in the northeast of the U.S. And I think of 19th century Chicago a bit like maybe Silicon Valley today, where that was the place to go if you want to found a big business. And so you get all these people kind of gravitating towards Chicago later in life and founding these big businesses. And, and Armour is kind of the most charismatic example of that. Mm -hmm. Was there any pushback to this? Were there any groups that, that really opposed what was going on, both from a labor point of view, a health point of view, etc.? So there were. And so this, is, this kind of explains why the industry looks that way. So at some point, as the Chicago meatpackers are getting more and more powerful, ranchers start to organize. They start to have kind of national rancher organizations to protest, and they start going to Washington and saying, you have to investigate the fact that these meatpackers are often colluding against us. You know, when we go to sell our cattle at what should be an auction in the Chicago's Union Stockyards, we're only getting one bid. So they start to organize. Similarly, uh, traditional butchers, who, wholesale butchers who are going bankrupt, they start to organize what they call butcher protective associations. And they go to Washington and they start to say the same thing. They say, basically, these people are engaging in predatory pricing to drive us out of business. And they organize boycotts. Lastly, you get unions, right, or nascent unions, worker organization, starting to say, you know, we're going to have strikes. These people are exploiting us. All three of those groups ultimately fail. And they ultimately fail because they seem like particular interests. And all the solutions they propose, and you see this in the kind of congressional investigations of the meatpacking industry, their solutions would all raise prices. And so what the meatpackers say is, if you want us to keep the general public happy, you're going to have to tolerate this kind of exploitation. And so the meatpackers and the public who gets very worked up about sanitation, they kind of indirectly cooperate, solve the problems of sanitation, and all those other protest groups essentially get ignored. Mm -hmm. How much of these issues have filtered into the business today? 
I think that's an important question. I think, I mean, I think a lot of the dynamics are still there today. So recently you had ranchers complaining about suspicions about the prices they were getting offered for their cattle from the big meat processors. So there's still this kind of dynamic of a few companies controlling marginal ranchers and producers. You still have concerns about labor. So in my story, there were the slaughterhouse laborers were mostly recent immigrants from Eastern Europe. Today, they're often undocumented people who are in a similarly marginal situation who have trouble securing their rights for fear of retaliation. And so you get that same kind of dynamic. You also get a dynamic of kind of concerns about the environment being largely ignored or minimized by essentially good prices and consumer trust in their food. Now, things are changing today a bit. Um, you're seeing concerns about beef production and climate change. Uh, this is particularly an issue with beef production worldwide in places like Brazil. And so there are some changes, um, but I think my, my book would suggest that, that those are going to be a real challenge. Um, any way to kind of mitigate the excesses of the system are going to increase prices, as I've suggested throughout. And so we have to think about how we both make meat more expensive, but perhaps also more obtainable by people. As it becomes more expensive, is it less of an issue today, given that there are certainly more choices for the consumer there? I think so, but I think we do have to remain sensitive to kind of the class implications of, of that choice, right? Which is to say, we, we want kind of pressure from organic producers or more environmentally uh, conscious producers to not simply exist as a, a niche product that, that the wealthier people can afford, but a way to kind of transform a fundamental critique of all food production. And I think if we can do that, we'll kind of reform all food production. It will become more expensive. As you say, there are alternatives. But I also think we have to think about system uh, processes of kind of economic justice that will also make everyone able to, af to have that kind of choice that wealthier Americans enjoy in general. How has globalization impacted the beef industry? Well, especially as uh, red meat consumption in the U.S. has kind of plateaued and started to decline in recent decades, uh, beef exports have become very important. Um, but also just the kind of dynamic I talk about in the book, namely that you know, everyone wants more and more beef to consume and view it as a metric for their success in America, that's become a dynamic worldwide. So the expanding middle class worldwide views beef consumption as an important sign of their success. And that dynamic certainly is, is going to have major consequences as we see the expansion of beef production having major environmental impacts in places like Brazil. And so I think of it as like some of the dynamics I see in the 19th century in the U.S. are starting to become global ones. And unless we figure out a way to address that, that's going to pose serious environmental and economic challenges. It's interesting how long beef has lasted as this kind of metric of success. It really is. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I've been able to, to totally figure out why. Um, I think that it has always, you know, there's, there's obviously a good taste proposition, tastes good. Um, it's always kind of been at the peak of the conceptual food hierarchy that, you know, you think about having a steak. And I think there's a bit of the association between red meat and kind of manliness that's very important to this story. You know, six, not just successful people, but also successful men go to a steakhouse. And so I think that's been a very durable association, perhaps due to the broader cultural success of the United States, right? The United States is associated with wealth worldwide, and so then beef, which is so important in the United States, becomes that model. I don't really know how, to, how that will change over time, but it certainly seems durable. Right, I mean, the other side of the equation, though, is equally interesting when we look at the way fast food hamburgers particularly have gone to the complete other side of the economic spectrum. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good point. That's really interesting. I think, though, that still... That is the other end of the spectrum, but it's still kind of, they kind of benefited from that. This idea that, you know, everyone can have a hamburger all the time um, is still certainly there. But I think that that is interesting. And I think it, it's worth thinking about how fast food kind of changes the equation. And that might also explain why. So they didn't really have fast food in that sense in the late 19th century. But you did have people talking about why um, poor Americans wouldn't just settle for worse cuts of meat. 
And so I think the dynamic you do see with fast food is consuming more of it, but also that people may want this kind of luxury or higher end fast food you've noticed in recent years with these fancier burger places. It's also interesting the pushback we see now to any environmental concern about the impact of the industry. Yeah, I think, although I think that the whole conversation around the environmental impact is interesting to me as a historian because you don't really see that kind of story in the 19th century, which is to say, as I've been telling you, people don't, didn't really care about the production story as long as there were prices were good and, and you know, they weren't worried about sanitation. Today, there's a lot of pushback around debates about climate change and beef, but people are talking about how beef is produced, um, and that's, that's a new and important development. Um, I think it, it's partially a consequence of various companies with an interest in, in pushing that conversation. You often see this with meatless or veggie burger companies. You also see this with a general kind of environmental politics. Um, and so I think the politicization of beef consumption, which is certainly new in the past 20 years, right? Some people saying, no, we have to eat beef. And you'd have people at CPAC talking about, <laughs> you know, uh, right. progressives coming for your hamburgers. I think that's an interesting development. And I'm curious how that's going to unfold. What's remarkable about it also, and, and this is unlike some other luxury good industries, is that the beef industry itself, while they have conducted marketing campaigns over the years, they haven't really played, it seems like, a significant role in shaping public attitude, that it's happened outside of the industry in many respects. Yeah, I think that that's interesting, and that's, I think, something they need to be maybe aware of and more engaged with. I think that's a consequence of the strategy they had, you know, around 1900. They wanted to be behind the scenes as much as possible, because I think they figure anytime people are talking about kind of beef and its production is potentially uh, uncomfortable ground for them, right? They, they don't want people thinking about that. They want, they want to ride on the fact that people like beef, and they want more of it. And so what that means is they've kind of left themselves out of the conversation, relying just on the fact that beef tastes really good. Now, what that means, though, in recent years is I think they've been caught a little bit flat-footed with a lot of these critiques. Um, and in recent years, you see people trying to kind of counter this, You um, starting even from the Where's the Beef campaign, but also ranching um, groups have recently started promoting beef positively. And I think so I think that's going to start to change their strategy of being behind the scenes, and it's cost them a bit recently. And, of course, the ranching industry, oddly enough, has a better image still than parts of the beef industry. For sure. I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the place of the ranching industry today. I think they're in a very tough spot because they're caught in a spot where they want to pr promote beef consumption, uh, but they're also kind of marginalized by the beef processors. So you get these periodic protests behind the scenes where they're talking about how they feel like they're being fleeced, but they have to kind of still push beef consumption in general, and the food processors rely on that. The food processors want to show, you know, pictures of ranchers and happy cattle. They don't want to show their slaughterhouses. And so the, meat, the ranchers have no choice. They have to basically rely on these big industrial beef processors at the same time that they're being fleeced by them. Joshua Specht, his book is Red Meat Republic, a hoof-to-table history of how beef changed America. Joshua, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thanks. It was a great conversation. Thank you.